the addition of soy lecithin and especially phospho and purified phospholipids increase the metabolic uh, activity of energy extraction from these fat sources. Hello, everyone. My name is Doug Corver, and I'm one of the hosts of the Poultry Podcast Show. Welcome to our latest installment. If you find this interview interesting, please let us know by visiting our website at wisenetics.com. You can also learn more about all of our podcast segments, which cover poultry, swine, dairy, beef, feed milling, and pet food. And you can feel free to suggest a, a new guest for our podcast as well. Our guest today is Dr. Shandor Sharnoche. Did I get that right? Perfect. Excellent. Uh, and Shandor is with Berg and Schmidt Animal Nutrition, and he is the uh, lead for monogastrics. Is that correct? I am a poultry global uh, species manager. Okay. Well, welcome back to the show. We've, uh, we've hosted you on the podcast before, and it's good to have you back. Thank you very much. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your current position? First and foremost, greetings to everyone, and I'm very happy to be here again. Thanks, Doug, for your nice introduction. So I have been with Bergen Schmidt in the last almost nine years in the function as a technical support manager responsible for monogastric nutrition and positioning our product line, including phospholipids, as the topic of discussion today. Your partner in improving animal performance, Berg and Schmidt. They believe the following additives are necessary in the poultry dietary. Functional lipids for an efficient dietary energy management. Phospholipids for emulsification, achieving a better nutrient intake. MCTs to provide energy and modulate the microflora within the intestines and enzymes for elevated use of fibrous materials and byproducts. Tell us a little bit more about Berg and Schmidt. Uh, Berg and Schmidt is one of the pioneers in uh, phospholipid nutrition, including fatty acids, uh, fatty acid esters, and also uh, specialist for lipid products for animal nutrition, including uh, as well as human nutrition. Uh, has the company been around for a long time? Oh, yes. Uh, the company has really started off in the early 80s. And uh, the turning point came about uh, 1985 or 1986, where it was establishing uh, a huge tank farm in the Rotterdam port that allowed the transportation of soy lecithin from, mainly from South America in large quantities, 500 to 1,000 tons uh, in one shipment. And this tank farm enabled the competitiveness of lecithin products, both for human and animal nutrition production. When you were last on the uh, poultry podcast show, you were in the midst of a move from uh, Singapore to Germany. Um, <laughs> how has that gone? And how has the change been in terms of your day-to-day -day work? Ah, it's wonderful. We have excellent colleagues in both both sides of the, so to speak, uh, <laughs> in Singapore and in Germany, they facilitated my move very smoothly. Of course, it's a big change, obviously, in terms of uh, climate and weather. It happened in the summertime, so mm -hmm. it gradually grew into the winter at the moment. So we are just waiting for the spring to start <laughs> and, the, and the summer to come back again. Otherwise, yeah. it's fantastic. Germany is a fantastic place to be, and our headquarters, of course, is located in Hamburg, mm -hmm. where... We have a long history of uh, uh, existing, and the Stern Vivio Group has a headquarters for the whole group here. So about yourself, how did you first get involved in poultry nutrition? Oh, um, I finished my PhD studies in the U.S. in 1997. Then 1998, I started with Cargill as a piglet feed formulator, <laughs> surprisingly. And uh, during my career in the last 25 years, I have been involved with Adiseo. Hmm. Adiseo in the early, about 20 years ago, and they, they taught me poultry nutrition. So for which I'm very grateful. And uh, the French know the business of poultry nutrition really well. And I, that's how I started on the poultry well, to, 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 departing from pigs to poultry a little bit. <laughs> and over the years, um, we, we perceive poultry segment of the global animal industry 
animal husbandry industry as one of the fastest organically growing segment and the and the largest and the cheapest how can i say source of uh, high high quality protein for the grow, growing population of the earth so that's mm-hmm. why we think it's very important for us so bergen schmidt is known for functional lipids can you describe what that means yes uh, besides providing energy or managing metabolizable energy in the diets we also create specialist lipid products that have the ability to to enhance the the digestibility of common fats or common oils and fats and um, for this reason we manufacture specialist lipids like phospholipids we also have functional lipids that are responsible for modulating the gut microbiota and also we can control or at least assist uh, in the in the global effort to reduce AGPs. Mm-hmm. So we can control the pathogenic bacterial populations or proliferation of gram positives and gram negatives. And for this reason, we are producing dedicated glycerides, monoglycerides mainly, and free fatty acid based products. Okay. So you, you talked about the effect on nutrient digestibility. Um, how do these products, how do these phospholipids influence digestibility? They increase the, the, so to speak, the perception of energy content metabolically. In other words, uh, let's take the example of beef tallow as an example, or, or, or this is where most of the studies have been done oh, more than 40 years ago, that they indicated that addition of soy lecithin and especially phospho- and purified phospholipids increase the metabolic uh, activity of energy extraction from these fat sources, because the problem is absorption. And when the animals are young, they don't have the necessary endogenous lipase production enough to be able to extract or absorb the, the right amount of, let's say, beef tallow components that would be necessary to maintain or help the rapid growth, what they have to grow through. So when you add these specialist lipids, including phospholipids, we help the emulsification. So in uh, one unit of time, we can extract more energy. Technically, that's how it is. And Mm -hmm. um, based on my um, literature reviews, um, the average, on average, we can increase the digestibility five to six percent in 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 saturated fatty fat fat sources, mm-hmm. and to a lesser degree in in polyunsaturated vegetable oils, two to three percent, about half in comparison to beef tallow, let it be crude palm oil, and so on. Mm-hmm. So, so it's not simply increasing the energy content of the diet by the value of the the phospholipids. There's in it. Uh, a synergistic effect to increase uh, uh, beyond the average. Exactly, dog. And, you know, uh, you also have to determine what would be the set rate of addition of the phospholipids. Mm -hmm. And once you determine this, you can assign um, a theoretical value that you can kind of uplift the metabolizable energy content. If it's, we are talking about in chicken nutrition or poultry nutrition, apparent metabolizable energy, nitrogen corrected about depending on the fatty acid profile and this is crucial so mm-hmm. for one end you have to have a set rate of addition and secondly you have to be able to understand what you are using today that's what you want to uplift so to speak or upgrade in other words mm-hmm. and this is depending on heavily on the total saturated fat versus total unsaturated fatty acid profile and we have uh, these milestones, if you will, that, that the, it determines how much you can assign as uplift value. All right. So it, it really depends on uh, the characteristics of the, the main fat that you're feeding as to how much phospholipid you would add. Absolutely. And also determines the age of the chickens because they're evaluating, or if I can say such a word in English, they, they appreciate uh, the same fat source differently in terms of uh, early development versus growing and late uh, finishing stage because they are more mature. So the maturation process also determines it. But let me give you one example. Um, in, in, in Asia and in around the world, in many places, they use crude palm oil as an example. 
uh, which is uh, the total saturated fatty acids versus total unsaturated fatty acids are almost roughly the same. So 50-50, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. With this, uh, of course, this is posing a problem, especially in young age, because they cannot extract as much energy as it possibly can give them. So when you add an emulsifier or nutritional emulsifier, when you are when we are talking about uh, concentrated phospholipid sources, we can uplift the energy. We can help the chickens to digest more of these kind of difficult for a young couple of day old chickens, about two to 3%. And mm -hmm. the way it works in practice is that we are uplifting the energy value. And on the same price basis, when you do a least cost feed formulation, of course, naturally the computer will choose that one, but you have to be absolutely sure that it works. So that's why we have university studies, peer reviewed papers supporting this, this theory. And mm -hmm. another example could be that the most ubiquitous uh, uh, feed grade or feed energy source is soy oil, which is highly unsaturated, okay, where the total saturated fatty acid content is no more than 15, 16% by volume, and the remainder, remainder is mono or polyunsaturated fatty acids. So how can you uplift? Very little chance. But mm -hmm. you can help to reduce the oxidization or further stop the further oxidization in the presence of concentrated phospholipids. So the chance to uplift is much less, mm -hmm. but it helps still that the digestibility. Plus, uh, we also have a lot of trials from, um, from universities determining the liver markers, like total antioxidant capacity and so on. Mm -hmm. monoaldehyde content and also triglyceride content in the blood can be reduced in the presence of phospholipids. This is, this is, I think, fantastic. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Do the phospholipids themselves act as uh, antioxidants directly or is there some other uh, mechanism of action? Well, I believe that first and foremost, they also, uh, depending on their uh, phospholipid fraction, so to speak, because we, we determine four different at least from the animal nutrition point of view, we like to talk about phosphatidylcholine, which is the most abundant. Then we have a phosphatidylethanolamine. We have a phosphatidylinositol and phosphatidic acid. These are the four major. And they serve as a, as a methyl group donor. And that's how they are facilitating indirectly the, I mean, improving the oxidative status at gut and enterocyte level and also in the liver markers that you can measure it back. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. So we know that, that birds themselves are able to synthesize phospholipids. Uh, so why, what is the opportunity for uh, adding dietary phospholipids uh, in modern poultry production? I think uh, from the practical point of view, um, many times a bit of a neglected the dietary level of choline, pure choline levels. And this is where the, the addition or external addition especially concentrated phospholipids can help mm -hmm. together with other sources of, uh, of choline, of course, not just solely as it is. So I, I talk about complementary effect here, but usually what I observe, at least where I'm active in those markets, that the pure dietary choline levels are low. I'm talking about 1200 milligram or less, mm -hmm. which would be, I think would be required minimum to be 1500 milligrams per kilo, because these are the modern breeds of poultry, meat type of, of chicken as an example, they have an extremely rapid growth. And we know from physiology that uh, they not only re require just energy, but also to be able to build the blood vessels so they, they can build bones, they can build the muscles, they can build build all the tissues technically. And this is ex extremely dependent on on having uh, a good level of choline present mm -hmm. and uh, among other nutrients, of course. But mm -hmm. we see the a tremendous positive improvement when you increase the dietary choline level from 1200 to 1500 or above in, in the rate of chicken growth or also and also overall health status, because then you improve also the blood markers or some of the liver markers. And then technically the, the, the biggest challenge what I face is to remind our 
our clients and and practitioners that besides that we understand fantastic in my opinion how to make the bones grow we understand fantastically in the broiler chickens how to make happen the breast meat yield and also the thighs and so on nobody or rarely we're talking about developing the nervous system and this is where the phospholipids come in hand and that's when we have a sub uh sub adequate levels dietary levels externally i'm talking about uh, this is helping to replenish or maintain the necessary levels to develop those tissues and you're also mentioned dog that yes the phospholipids are so important in my opinion physiologically that most vertebrates try to recycle and, and produce their own right and mm -hmm. uh, but it's not uh, never 100 percent efficient unfortunately there are losses so external supplementation helps a lot especially in the rapid growing chickens and also layers imagine the uh, today i think a, a modern layer flock is capable of living up to 110 weeks or in, even beyond we're talking about, mm -hmm. right? But the sad reality in practice, what I've seen at least, that we have to call most of them out before they reach 90. Why is that? Because during the peak laying period, they are so attuned, so selected to, to, to make an egg in every 25, 26 hours. So they leach out <laughs> their own phospholipid reserves and if you don't do not supply we cannot realize fully their genetic potential so that's 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 the reason uh, and consideration for practical nutrition is to consider adding next to choline chloride or whatnot uh, mm -hmm. methionine the phospholipids are very important in this respect because they're also active part of the of the of the bile which mm -hmm. in the early stages of development is not enough unfortunately right so, so there's a, an effect at the level of the gut in terms of availability of nutrients and formation of micelles and fat digestion. Um, are the phospholipids absorbed intact from the gut as well? Now, this is a very interesting question because in the past we thought that uh, first and foremost, they're also prone to be cleaved by by the lipase enzymatic activity, obviously. Mm -hmm. And the past in the past we thought that because depending on the phospholipids, where they are originating from, we also have to make a distinction. Most of the phospholipids today in animal nutrition are coming from soy, but we also have sources from uh, canola and also sunflower. They have a different uh, fatty acid profiles a little bit, yeah. plus a different uh, phos uh, phospholipid fractions. But the, the scenario to your question is the same. So they get either cleaved or can be absorbed, but it's a much lesser process. And we are talking about the differentiation between uh, active and passive transportation. Now, in the past, we thought that the large fatty acids, when they are cleaved by the lipases, they are passively transported. That's not true. They have to have a dedicated mechanism. I'm talking about large fatty acids, C C14 and 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 beyond C16, C18, and so on. They need to have a dedicated transportation mechanism. However, when you have a medium chain, fatty acids attached to the glycerol, as an example, they can be absorbed passively as well. But mm. of, of course, we know that in the passive transportation, we also have differentiation depending on what is the mediating. Either it's a free or, or mediated by certain uh, how's how it called channels and also mm -hmm. dedicated routes yeah so back to your question uh in some aspects uh, uh intact phosphorylated molecule is i think huge if you look mm -hmm. at the molar molar weight of those uh uh phospholipid fractions they're 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 enormous molecules so they cannot be rarely can be in my opinion absorbed they have to be cleaved but mm -hmm. they help in the process of emulsion in the gut yeah. Uh, lumen, and that's that's one of the forte, in my opinion. Plus, they provide additional nutrition, and I like to stress it out because if you measure analytically uh, a one kilo of pure or diol phospholipid or, or concentrated phospholipid source, you can technically measure the pure choline and also pure bioavailable phosphorus content of the product. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. And this is where also comes, even if you don't believe the, the, the uplift uh, fact or uplift feature of energy, but you can still measure those nutrients. And so they are nutritional emulsifiers, in my opinion, and that's one of the attractiveness of these type of products. Did I answer your question? I hope. Yes, so. yes, you did. <laughs> I'd like to remind our audience that if you find this or any of our previous topics worthwhile and informative, please subscribe to the Poultry Podcast Show YouTube channel. Uh, you can do this by clicking on the bell icon to receive our notifications. And you can also share uh, the video if you learned something new today. So, Shandor, when we're talking about uh, optimizing the level of phospholipid supplementation. You said it uh, depends on the age of the bird. It depends on the level of fat. It depends on the type of fat, the fatty acid mm -hmm. profile. So what would a, a typical level of supplementation be in a, a broiler starter diet? Okay. Um, we have uh, evidence over the last two, two and a half decades that usually the trick comes between 500 to 1000 grams per ton, metric ton of feed. So uh, because in broiler chickens, we want to have daily gain, obviously, and voluntary feed intake good. Uh, so the objective is is, is growth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's this is the two, two I would say, uh, values that, that, that are usable in practice. So 500 to 1,000 gram per ton. But the, the nutritional strategy, let's say, apart from meat type of chickens is different, of course, because we don't want weight gain in layers, obviously. So that's a different consideration. So back to your question, dog, I think uh, between one to two pounds for our US customers or US viewers um, do do well enough and economically enough to able to be able to appreciate the effect of uh, concentrated phospholipids. Let's talk a little bit about the practical aspect of adding this to the diet. What's the physical characteristics of the phospholipid product? Um, are there any special handling considerations required? It depends. Uh, depends. Uh, our company, uh, as just an example, uh, we are supplementing the full range of uh, of uh, phospholipids, meaning that we have the the standardized crude soy lecithin as as a product for the industry for those who want to use it only this way as also an energy source because the cr the crude soy lecithin contains about one third is oil so it's mm -hmm. it's oleic acid so those those determine the the behavior of the product a viscous slow flowing fluid when once you remove those lipids what you what you change the physical behavior of the product so what what it means you reduce the 30 35 percent oil content let's say to two percent as an example and the product becomes powderish, mm -hmm. and then you have to purify it up to the uh, to a level of acetone insoluble content, total acetone insoluble content, minimum to ninety five percent of the whole product. And if you increase it to ninety six percent, it becomes a wonderful powder. But it has to be considered and handled as 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 choline chloride because of moisture, attracting moisture, it's mm -hmm. the nature of the molecules. But uh, it's usable for those feed meals or feed companies or integrations who have no capacity to handle um, the liquid version, but they can add directly into the mixing chamber. That's mm -hmm. one of the avenues. And uh, we also have lysolecithin product ranges, either in liquid and also in dry form. Dry form is on a carrier, so it depends on what is the purpose and what you want to use it for. Mm -hmm. To make it simple, the crude soil lecithin I perceive as energy source. The concentrated de-oiled phospholipid sources are nutritional emulsifying agents together with other uh, mm -hmm. such products that provide very pure choline and also uh, highly available phosphorus. And the Lyso products are dedicated emulsifiers to make the most surface in one unit of time because in the chicken nutrition, we both know that the, the digestive process is fast. So mm -hmm. we, we don't have too much time to right. waste. <laughs> it's a fast process and the demands are high. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're right. So so let's, let's take a step back and talk about um, the egg. So the chicks obviously come from the egg. Much of the lipid in the egg is in the form of phospholipids. 
Um, so what role do yolk phospholipids play uh, in embryonic uh, and early post-hatch development? Um, and then uh, is there a role uh, for, for supplemental phospholipids in this? Okay, uh, let's, let's start with the eggs. I'm not very um, uh, educated in this field, but let, let me try my best in this one. I think um, when the uh, egg-laying hand creates the, the egg, okay, uh, she has to ensure that it's packed with all the nutrients necessary for the development of the chickens once it's, the egg is laid. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the critical part, in my opinion, is from day five and day 10 in embryonic development when the vitelline membrane is, is completely en enclosing the yolk. And this is where the, the vitelline membrane is one of the principal functions to, to feed the growing fetus, so to speak, or growing chicken. And after 10 days, the, the, the vitelline function is, is kind of reducing and by the day 19 to 20, this is disappearing. But I think this is where I think phospholipids create or help to maintain this barrier around the yolk as, mm -hmm. as malleable and as stable as possible because we don't want the, the content of the yolk to spread around the egg, right? We don't want to enter right. into, the, into the white. So I think... Um, when you go to Japan or Northeast Asia, you have the, you have the culture of eating raw eggs, right? So technically, they always test the nutritional, how can I say, value of the egg, the raw egg, to be able to pick up the yolk. And this mm. is where we can help, either in, if we are going for the uh, hatching eggs or table eggs, we can mm. supplement those, those breeders or commercial egg layers with the external uh, phospholipid source to ensure that this is this is properly forming around the yolk, and I think the preserving the yolk is crucial. At least this is the one of my memories comes up from from <laughs> from. But I'm not an expert in this one, but <laughs> please I, correct me wrong, dog. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's that's a, a good answer. So thanks for that. Thank what you. about uh, what about the meat? So we grow broilers obviously for the meat. Um, does phospholipid supplementation have an influence on on the meat quality or, or the meat composition? This is a very interesting and good question, Doc, because uh, phospholipids are also delivering poly and mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids. Okay, and we also know that in cases depending on the source where they are from, uh, and also the fatty acid profile can also have some palmitic acid as well, and uh, we know from our trials done over a decade ago that uh, a certain ratio of palmitic acid plus a certain ratio of total unsaturated and total polyunsaturated fatty acid ratios which is the one of our one of our uh, kind of um, know-how in our company that uh, helps to to increase the or reduce in other words the drip loss okay mm -hmm. of poultry meat Plus, uh, many times we have the challenge uh, of uh, breast meat, the breast meat quality as an example, and a bit of uh, attention to the palmitic acid content of the diet can help to enlarge those fat deposition uh, global, so to speak, in, in, into the, into the broiler, broiler breast that mm -hmm. increases the succulency and also not to, not to be too dry when you are cooking or frying right. the, the, the chickens. But um, so, in other words, I think, but you also have to know that uh, most of the fat deposition that we can influence it, in my understanding in chickens is the subcutaneous fat, which is, which is a very significant uh, deposition area if in a, on a healthy chicken. And this is where uh, addition of a bit of uh, palmitic acid as, as saturated fatty acid can help to increase the crispiness when you are frying the, the okay. chicken. So yes, you can. In fact, um, we are talking more about red meat and the red meat composition is de is dependent on the fatty acid profile, even though in, in grain and cereal based diet, we know that uh, the liponeogenesis is, is of course, uh, is important, but not to a certain level and degree. So we have to have an attention as well on, again, on the dietary fatty acid profile of the diet. And this is where our 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 solutions come handy. So right. 
we can influence the breast meat and also we can influence the the red meat sections of the chickens to be more succulent, to be more mm. enjoyable. So earlier uh, in our conversation, we were talking about um, the role of lipids, perhaps in being part of um, the strategy to replace antibiotic growth promoters. Can you talk a little bit more about that? How, how do fatty acids uh, uh, play a role or could play a role? Okay, uh, we, we are entering into the realm of a medium chain fatty acids and their respective derivatives or esterified versions. Um, yes, it's, this is a, as a, it, in, it's a hot topic in the last, let's say, five to 10 years, so to speak. And uh, much earlier uh, studies have been done uh, mainly in Europe when, the, when the, officially the use of AGPs was banned in the European Union January 1st, 2006. So a lot of universal, a lot of work was done in the preceding years to this date. And we, that's when actually they found out that the, from C6 to C12, I'm talking about these, these are the specialist medium chain fatty acids and especially the monoglycerides are extremely potent to modulate the gut microbiota enough that the beneficial ones, the lactic acid producing strains can overpopulate. And at the same time, the pathogenic bacterial population can, can be stopped. Mm -hmm. The objective is not to kill, in my opinion, because to have a, a killing uh, a concentration is not economical these days. But if we are good enough to stop, what I mean is, if we can reduce the colony forming those colonies by two lock scale, as an example, is good enough for the mm -hmm. beneficial ones to overpopulate those spaces. And I think this is what one of the effects, what we are using. Plus, if you look at in an example, and which is our, one of our flagship uh, approaches or solutions, is the uh, monolauric, monolaurine. Uh, we, we are one of the, uh, I think, uh, unique producers in the world that we have the highest purity. We have we are guaranteeing more than 90% content purity and within it also 90% plus alpha monolauric. And this is crucial because the position where, you know, the lauric acid is located on the glycerol backbone is, is mm -hmm. crucial to, to affect to affect the pathogenic, back, the gram positives pr primarily. And once you do that, uh, when you control the gram positives, in my understanding, especially in the first seven to ten days of the development of the chicken, you can you can reduce the incidence or the chances to develop uh, dysbiosis. Okay, and when the gram negatives absolutely invade everything. So if you do a good job in the beginning, and this is where I think the merit of these uh, medium chain monoglycerides come together with other nutrients other specialist compounds, phytocompounds, mm -hmm. and even acidifiers, let's put it this way, then as a toolbox uh, component, this is really good to avoid using sulfurepitic antibiotics and let, let the antibiotics do when the veterinarians determine the problem and they, it's a short, short uh, period usage to cure the, 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 actually the disease, right? But right. once we want to con you know, control and reduce the incidence of resistance, as an example, then I think the, the future is bright, even also for short chain monoglycerides and also medium chain monoglycerides, because at the moment there is no reported resistance against these pathogens, from, from these pathogens against these compounds. So that's why they are becoming more and more important. And you know, in my experience from practice, talking about Asia and also Middle East, everyone is paying attention now. So this is, this is, that's why we, we, we believe that this is, this is going to be even further revolutionizing the reduction of AGPs and we have to find new solutions. And there are so many good ones. And the good thing is the lipid products work very well in synergy with others. Mm -hmm. So there's no contraindication. And that's, I think, one of the key elements, and that's why we are successful in this field. Yeah, that sounds uh, like an exciting uh, opportunity. <laughs> yes, the development I'll be watching is someone who uh, is interested in gut health. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. 
And, you know, nobody is a pure expert, and that's the good thing about it. So if we pull our knowledge together, we have the right solutions of what, you know, some someone might need, or together with other good solutions, let it be enzymes, NSPs, as an example. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yes, so they work very well together. That's our experience from the fit. When it comes to purity, performance, and immunity, High D has been helping layers, broilers, and turkeys stand long for years. As the proven source of pure 25-OH D3 for diet fortification, High D is the fastest and most efficient way to provide birds with essential vitamin D. One product, 25 plus years on the market, more than 100 research trials, and 3 billion birds fed per year. There's only one High D. Learn more at dsm.com forward slash hy d. Is there anything that you'd like to talk about uh, in addition? I would like to welcome those who are watching these this podcast to find out more. Definitely to subscribe and also to get in touch with us if they want to have a bit more in-depth information. And they should not be hesitant to visit our website as well. And uh, also Google our company name as an example uh, or, or get in touch with you and uh, ask for further clarification of some issues because, you know, phospholipids are fantastic, uh, uh, very fascinating subject just for the enjoyment of it. Our colleagues in our company have written a one and a half inch thick book about this subject. So, and this is re- this has been published in 2021, and we are stepping on the on the shoulders of giants here. We have wonderful mm-hmm. R and D colleagues, and and uh, very serious research is going on, especially on the human application side. Okay. So that is uh, the animal nutrition enjoys the precipitation of this knowledge. And uh, so we will be very happy to provide a, any kind of consultation. In fact, it's, this is one of our forte that we do anal- analyses of diets as a third eye for free. So hmm. we, we always uh, encourage our existing or would-be uh, clients to, to do so. And um, we, we, we just keep an honest opinion of this. And yes, um, we, will, we, are, we are here to serve you <laughs> for everyone, of course. Well, great. Uh, so if people are interested in more information, they can uh, go to the Berg and Schmidt uh, website and hopefully uh, find the information they're looking for. Thank you so much. So thank you, Shanda, for your time. Uh, it's been a great conversation and uh, it's been very interesting learning about um, phospholipids and, and short and medium chain fatty acids. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Looking forward to our next meeting. Yes, and and thank you to our audience for uh, joining us today on the Poultry Podcast Show. If you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a thumbs up on whatever platform you're using to view it. And uh, we'll see you next time. I'm Doug Corver for the Poultry Podcast Show.